I'm Matt Reynolds, and this is my podcast. David, thanks for doing this. No problem at all. Can we start with the Axel brand and an overview of all that you've got happening as it stands at the moment? Right, okay. Uh, well, the, the Axel brand started in 2010. My wife, Zoe, and I uh, opened the first cafe and roastery in Hawthorne okay. in Burwood Road. Yeah. And uh, we opened that one and started supplying a small number of cafes with roasted coffee. Yeah. And from that point, we, um, we moved on and started opening other cafes. Yes. So we opened an uh, espresso bar in the city on Flinders Lane, just a small little uh, 20 square meter shop. And then from there, we've expanded now into Chadston Shopping Centre and a couple more in the city. And uh, we now find ourselves at six stores under the Axel brand. Okay. And this all started <laughs> back with, I'm assuming at some point, your first cup of coffee. Would that be right? Well, and it started, yeah, I suppose it started long before that. Yes. I, I first came out of high school and did a degree in uh, hotel management. Okay. And always envisaged myself working in a five-star hotel. Yep. <coughs> Sorry. And um, yeah, and from that point, I worked in hotels and restaurants. And it wasn't until later in my hospitality career that I eventually uh, got into coffee. Okay. And why coffee? Because if you're working in that hospitality field, there's a number of directions you could go within that field, right? So why coffee? Uh, I just started, I was working for a big multinational catering company. And uh, there was a, a guy in there at the time that was working on their like coffee program across the whole company. Yes. And he started bringing in different brand or samples of coffee from around the world and we were tasting different things and he started to teach me about coffee um, and that's sort of really what uh, sparked my interest in it. And then uh, a job came up as a sales representative with a, a coffee company um, and he put me forward for that job. And I uh, went through the interview process and all of a sudden I was out on the roads of Melbourne selling coffee. Selling coffee. And how, how long did you do that for? Uh, so I stayed with that, that company. That was part of the Sarah Lee Corporation. So I stayed with them for five years. Yep. And then uh, I moved to another local roaster um, here in Melbourne and did another five years with them um, before eventually going out uh, and opening Axel. And we have a little background noise going on here today because you've just moved into your new roasting facility? Yeah, finally uh, we have like a purpose-built coffee roasting facility. So how long did you um, spend in the sale of coffee before this became your own business idea? Because it's quite a a big jump, isn't it, from working as a a salesman to wanting to get your own operation up and running? Yeah, I mean, I suppose uh, I was fortunate enough to work with a few different... In the first company I worked with at Sarah Lee, I had a a state manager and a national manager that were really passionate and really good at what they did. Yes. And they taught me a lot about the financial modeling and how everything worked behind the scenes of, of a coffee sort of business. <clears throat> and then the next company I worked for, uh, they also had strong ties into cafes and restaurants and owned some of their own. Yep. So I got, once again, a little bit more exposure into the background of um, yeah, how to run successful cafes. Okay, so you had the, had the business idea, is this something you worked uh, a way out in the background where you were still selling coffee or how did that how did that come about uh, I mean yeah during during the, the, that 10 years with those two coffee companies I'd opened a um, a bar and sort of uh, restaurant nightclub in the city of Melbourne right, okay. and uh, the whole thing went disastrously wrong right. so I'd owned <laughs> uh, I'd owned a couple of successful cafes yeah. and uh, I you know typical young and a little bit invincible and I thought oh it's fine I'll just go and do this restaurant and bar and uh, I went in and it was I think it lasted like a year or so it was just a complete complete failure and so at that point I lost a large amount of money um, and that sort of slowed me down a bit and uh, I started like looking at yeah you learn a lot more like during those failures than I did during the successes and that sort of yeah set me on that path to set me up to try and uh, work out a business model around the coffee industry at that stage to push forward. So I wrote a business plan and uh, I actually went to the marketplace and I approached some cafe owners I knew um, to yeah. see if they were willing to invest um, into Axel at the beginning. Yeah. So still to this day, I have the original three cafe owners that I approached as my silent partners. 
All right. Okay. Um, so yeah, I took that business plan just on a sheet of paper. Yep. Um, you know, I got it printed up at Officeworks and Bound, and went and dropped it. And uh, based on that proposal, they wrote some large checks and back some money in behind me, and uh, and then the rest is history. In that one pager, was there anything uh, particularly special that you felt that you wrote? Because to get large investments out of out of one piece of paper, that's uh, oh, it's that's probably exactly, it was a few more than one. It was probably about fifteen or twenty pages. But okay. yeah, the, the the general just at that point, I'd already um, been quite successful in the barista competition. So at that point, okay. I was the five time Victorian barista champion, okay. and I'd uh, won two Australian championships, just returned from the World Championships, being runner up. Yep. So they saw, particularly on the back of that, that the, the PR and marketing around um, that success would allow us to launch this business and be successful. So you were pretty well known or you had become pretty well known because of those competitions before you decided to go into business. Is that right? Yeah. like yeah, or, I mean, To a reasonable amount. Yeah, to a reasonable amount. I mean, to a very, very small amount of people in the specialty coffee industry. I mean, to the, the people that count, right? When you're yeah. trying to get something off the ground, I guess you'd yeah. say. Well, yeah, when you're trying to get something off the ground, that's that's particularly important. But uh, that's the funny thing about the barista competition. It's the uh, you know, coffee industry is such a huge industry, but still the barista competition is a very a small niche thing that only sort of like a small amount of the industry sort of uh, know about and participate in. Yep. So I was unaware that there was even a competition until I sort of started doing some reading for obviously our chat today. What goes in the preparation of that competition? Because um, it's effectively a panel of judges, three in the video that I found online and watched, yeah. um, and you present courses of coffee to the judges, right? Correct. Is that an over, overview, a rough yeah. overview of the competition? <clears throat> yeah, so there's four, four judges on the panel. Four, okay. yeah. so four judges on the, on the panel, that, that they're the sensory judges that taste the coffee. Yep. There's two technical judges that are watching everything you do technically behind the coffee machine. Yes. And there's a head judge that oversees those judges, basically. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, in, in a general format, you have to serve four espresso, four milk-based beverages, okay. and then four signature drinks. Yes. And the signature drinks is to highlight um, or showcase the coffee that you've used during your routine. Um, and, and in a general format, that's that's the rules that we work around. Yep. Um, and, and yeah, he came runner up in the in the world. Yeah, it was. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's still. I mean, still, it's it's amazing, and it, it helped me to do what I've done today. And yep. so I look back fondly at it. It's still a small amount of disappointment, obviously, when you don't. We, we'd worked for a number of years to try and to win, and um, it ended up coming down. It was five points out of 1,100 points was the difference between first and second that year. Oh, wow, that's a small um, margin. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you know, it's disappointing and all, but, uh, yeah, we just we just moved on, and obviously now the success of Axel and everything like that has, uh, has been fantastic off the back of that competition. Do you still serve your signature dish at all from that competition in terms of your signature coffee oh no so i mean that's that's one of the things is sometimes these signature drinks that we're preparing and everything like that they're not practical or relevant to a cafe sort of situation unfortunately okay so there's yeah you're not going to have that uh that sort of drink served on a daily basis in a cafe so it's sort of like um the catwalks of Milan and walking down the street in Hawthorne that we are now, you're probably not going to be wearing the same sort of uh, Oh, we get a bit of that in Hawthorne. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, that is true. you're entirely right. When you get to, I suppose, the the upper end or echelon of any industry yes. um, sometimes, and, and I suppose that's sometimes where people question the relevance of uh, the, the barista competition to the whole coffee industry. But, I mean, I okay. always look at it being into motorsport. I always look at, you know, Formula One. Yep. And we have ABS brakes now on our everyday cars. Yep. That technology came from Formula One 20 years ago. Yes. Um, we now have traction control. That that came technology from, came from there. Yep. And the barista competition has seen the same thing happen to the coffee industry. Yep. Um, it was only seven or eight years ago that baristas started um, weighing how many grams of coffee they dosed into the handle, they lock into the machine, yes. and weighing how much came out and trying to work a, a brew ratio as such. And now we're seeing that on an everyday basis in cafes in Melbourne, yes. baristas are weighing, the, and that came directly from that barista competition. So it's it definitely has 
um, some relevance in pushing the industry forward and uh, being cutting edge. I noticed in that video there was a particular way that, is it the cup you call it, that you work the coffee into? What do yeah. You, so you spent quite a bit of time actually uh, oh, you're representing the group handle. Yeah, the group, the group ha- handle yes. is the coffee machine. That, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, my uh, yeah, that's t- right. coffee I, uh, technical terms are right. up to scratch. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm basically working that coffee into the handle, try and make sure it's perfectly level yes. and got the same amount of coffee density throughout it. So that way when it extracts through the coffee machine, yes. there's no weak point where the water can push through. It evenly extracts uh, all okay. the coffee within the handle. If all the ground coffee was to one side then the water finds the path of least resistance. It's going to push through the lower side of the coffee. I understand. And you're going to get a, like a, a coffee that's not going to taste as good as it would had I have leveled it. And you're going for an even taste, I assume. Because you spent quite a bit of time like actually getting that right. And I thought, that doesn't look like a standard sort of cafe preparation. So there must be something in, in why you do that, obviously, in a competition. Yeah, scene. we're just so- trying to... Yeah, I mean, the competition... Uh, is so focused around the taste of the coffee. Yes. So there's, you know, I think now the point system's changed slightly over time, but I think now something like 80% of the points are based around the taste of those 12 cups of coffee. Okay, so it's important. It's it's the most critical thing, you know. Yeah. Um, it's what's hard about the Bristol competition. You go along to these competitions yeah. and you watch from the crowd and everyone's got beautiful cups and tablecloths and shirts on and everything like that. And... Uh, but you just have no idea who's really going to win because you're not tasting the coffee, only the judges are. I'd notice that. So you, you can't do any checking along the way? Oh, we have a, a preparation time. Yes. Whereas the barista, I am tasting cups of coffee and I'm you know dialing it in to make sure I'm representing the coffee as the best I can. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's, that's what's, we're not serving any cups of coffee to people in the audience or, or anything like that. So it's, uh, yeah, it's one of those hard things when you come and watch a barista competition you don't even get served a cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah. So um, you had the cafes, you had a couple of cafes before you started competing. Was that, did you have Axel before you started competing? That came that came afterwards? Yeah, Axel came later. So those cafes, because then you went and you created the the wholesale brand, is that right? Is that was the, is that where you started with, with uh, Axel? Have well, I got the yeah. sequence right here? <clears throat> yeah, so I, I started with a couple of cafes Way back, it would have been 2000, I think, I had my first cafe, which was down in St Kilda, yes. in the bottom of a, a, a building, a business building. Uh, and then I did another one in Sandringham, down on the beach. Yeah. Um, and then I did another one at Melbourne Central and Espresso Bar. So all under different names and sort of different business partners and things along the way. Then I did that bar that we won't talk about anymore yeah. in the city. <laughs> and then that's when I found myself back in full-time employment, um, working for a local roaster. Okay. And then I was just paying off the debt that I, I'd accumulated and then uh, just buying our time to be able to open Axel. And then uh, Axel opened as the cafe and the wholesale business at the same time we launched. Oh, okay, so they were together. Yep, they I were got together, it. out of the same building on Burwood Road. So the front of the building is the cafe, yes, and the back of the building was the roasting space, and you could look through the windows of the cafe into the roasting space. And how big's your operation today? You've got, oh, I don't know, I mean, like we're, yeah, six shops under the Axle brand, plus the roasting, and we have 120 staff now. Okay. So yeah. You seem pretty um, relaxed for someone who employs a, you know, the typical person that employs 120 people. So, uh, I mean, we uh, have a fantastic team to yes. be honest, and um, the model is really strong in the format. And we now have 11 of our staff that have bought into the Axel brand and are equity owners in the brand. Um, okay. And so, yeah, I mean, one of the hard things about hospitality is that. Um, you're so governed by the people in the store of what quality experience you're going to get. Yes. Um, so in most of the actual stores on a daily basis, yep. there'll be an owner that will be present within that store. So every time we go and we open a new Axel store, so we're building two new ones at the moment, yep. um, one of our senior staff will be offered to buy into that store. Okay, so that's be part of the way share. that you maintain that level of quality in terms of your service and what you're presenting to the public. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've got a couple of really strong mentors along the way where I, when I worked for the last local roaster, there was uh, the two guys that um, were fundamental were Craig and Rocky and they owned that company. Yep. And, um, you know, they always spoke about the fact that I was always much better off owning 70% of an extremely successful business 
than owning 100% of a lemon. Yes. And um, we've taken that sort of uh, philosophy yep. and we've moved that forward. And in every shop we do, um, my wife Zoe and I take a majority share yep. and we sell off a minority share to uh, one of our, the next senior staff in line. Yes. And how do, you, how do you choose those senior people? Do you have a set of criteria? Is it a, is it a gut feel? How do you go about finding that person? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a little bit of all that. There, there's, there's not a written criteria as such. It's definitely not off um, length of employment. Um, and I suppose we've needed to clarify that in recent times yep. um, because it's, it's been fantastic, that model, but we also have to manage it carefully so it doesn't become demotivating for yes. some staff that aren't offered shares in at this particular uh, point. Yes. Um, and it's always this like, aren't I next sort of concept. So it's a combination of, um, sure, like length of time, because we need that trust with that person, um, but it's also their skill set and what they can bring. And what we need is we need hospitality managers that will be in that store, open it every day, close it every night, and make sure that it's run perfectly well all day. Um, it's not it's not the money they do buy in obviously yes um, but it's not the money that we're really after it's the commitment to excellence in hospitality to make sure that each of the Axel brands is serving the best quality food and drink every day and when you sit up uh, excuse me when you set up a store how do you think about that process because we were talking a bit before we started recording and getting that right is super important to maintain the integrity of your brand and business, right? Yeah, I think uh, site selection is obviously the first thing yes. and that's uh, absolutely critical to, to any hospitality business is uh, where it is. And yeah, we were talking about the fact that we struggled uh, eight, nine years ago when we opened Axel to secure a site. Um, no one really knew who we were and uh, we really struggled to find it. We eventually got the building that we started in on Burrow Road Hawthorne. It went uh, to auction. And we attended the auction, um, obviously unable to purchase the building. It yes. goes without saying, but um, the bidding took place and the, the winning bidder um, that uh, bought the building, we went over to that winning bidder at the auction and said, we want to lease this building. We'll sign leases right now. And on the day you settle and take ownership, we'll pay rent from the first day. Um, this is the building we want. You know, Don't spend any money advertising it. We're ready to go. Yeah. Um, and randomly we didn't know at the time but the uh the person that bought the building their uh nephew was a barista in the melbourne coffee industry oh wow um and so when she saw our business plan um the lady that bought the building she showed it and he's like oh yeah i've heard i've heard of you know david macon and you know and so it's sort of all aligned and uh that's how we got our original building um yeah and was that your plan when you went to the auction to yes to track down the winning yep. bidder yeah, it was to stand there and wait to find who, uh, yeah, who bought the building, and then approach them straight away um, to see if they were planning on occupying it themselves, yeah. or if they were planning on leasing it. Had you done that previously? Oh no, we just got to a point where we were like, we were just desperately trying to find somewhere to open our business, okay. and trying to find somewhere that that was able to roast, but also to able to have a successful cafe. So we needed rear entry and a retail entry and we needed a certain space to be able to expand into. And yeah, I had a lot of sort of criteria that we needed. It, you know, it's, it's what's disappointing now sometimes is we took a, a Melways map back in the old day and we had it on all. We marked every successful specialty coffee business on the map in Melbourne mm -hmm. and we found a pocket that we believed was desperately needing something. Um, what you see more so now is that people come along and it's happened a lot to us in Hawthorne. They come along and see the success of ours and then they try and lease something, you know, 100 metres down the road with the idea of taking some of your business yes. and dividing the, the, the pie, you know, in smaller and smaller slices. Yeah. Um, and I suppose that's a little disappointing now in Melbourne. It's got to that. There's, there's still a couple of really successful operators that, that do the original um, process I spoke about where they're looking for a suburb that just has nothing and the people in that suburb are screaming out for a good offer yep. um, and I think that's where you're seeing those really successful cafes still come from because yeah a lot pops up in it's very trendy I suppose to own a cafe isn't it but yeah, um, very much so very different thing following a trend and uh, and having a successful business I suppose I should say as well so yeah um, 
people. How do you find staff? Uh, across the board, fantastic. Yep. Um, uh, in terms of yeah. to new staff to work in your operation, because you're continually growing, oh. so you've got to find new people, right? Yeah, sourcing staff. I mean, sourcing staff is always difficult, uh, yeah. but now we have some set systems in place. I suppose everyone knows McDonald's has really strong systems in the back end. The most famous um, one, we're, yeah. we're, we're nowhere near that level, yes. but we do have some, some set sort of service protocols of how to greet people, how to take orders, how to deliver orders, um, you know, how to deal with people at the takeaway counter. And we have some set documentation and systems now. We have an orientation um, mm. for all new staff members. We have a test now for all new staff members. Um, so some of those things have allowed us to, to make sure we keep the quality. Okay. And, no, excuse me, do you, um, find that in the, as you've built the brand, has that helped you in the recruiting process? Because whenever I have these conversations, most businesses eventually we come back to knowing people and finding finding the right people so has the evolution of your brand helped find more people to work making the expansion easier yeah i definitely don't think it hurts yes. i think that yeah people probably know the brand and therefore maybe we get a few more resumes sent in or or dropped off because of that yeah um definitely the the model where the staff are buying in those senior mm-hmm. staff that's definitely helped us as well because you're finding that we're attracting managers that want to be professional hospitality operators. Um, and so therefore they hear them on the grapevine of the ability to buy in. So they're joining us with a vision to get there. Yep. Um, the industry now is so definitely compared to when I started, there's uh, a lot more barriers to entry. You know, you used to be able to maybe go and, and set up a cafe for maybe like, 40 or 50 grand or something like that yes. um, it's just not like that anymore there's so many more levels of everything you have to do and therefore it's getting harder and harder maybe for a younger entrepreneurial type of hospitality person to get in Yes. and so by allowing them to buy in uh, that gives them that opportunity without having necessarily to come up with two or three hundred thousand dollars and do you incentivize below those levels as well in term, uh, in in a in a money sense, is that something you've built into your culture or not? Yeah. So all of our managers of all the stores, regardless of whether they own a share or not, yeah. are on a bonus system okay. that's around the labour cost. Yeah. Labour cost in the hospitality industry is the hardest thing for us. It's the hardest thing to control, um, and the hardest thing to do. And obviously, with penalty rates at the moment being on the front page of the paper every week, um, it's becoming more and more. Um, something we need to manage and, and need to be careful that we're compliant at all times. So I pro- I'm, I'm making an assumption here that um, uh, lease or property costs would have been the big one in the past and now it's moving to, wa- to more towards wages, is that? Oh, I think it's always been wages. Yes. And okay. I think that's probably why you've seen certain operators within the Melbourne hospitality industry not paying those award wages and yep. trying to skirt around the edges of it yep. because the labour cost is the one thing, it's the highest cost in hospitality. Yes. Um, so it always has been. So there, that's been forcing operators that maybe aren't making money uh, or, or are and are trying to make more illegally, yes. um, skirting around those, uh, those rates and everything like that. Where does your coffee come from, sort of moving to the other end of the of the process? Where are you, where are you com- currently getting your beans from? So we currently, so yeah, so we, we sort of try and do a direct trade model as much as we can, yeah. which is where we're flying to origin every year. Um, seeing the farmer, trying to taste all the different coffee has available, yeah. negotiating on what lots of coffee we want and what price we're willing to pay for them. Yeah. Um, so currently at the moment, we're traveling to Brazil, Colombia, El Salvador, Guatemala, Costa Rica, and we're just like, we've done uh, Africa on a couple of occasions and trying to do a little bit more. Okay, so you're going there yourself or your team's going there hand picking, checking, going through the farms. Is that actually what happens? Oh, I wouldn't say we're, we're doing any of the picking whatsoever, but yeah, we're... we're or picking we're, the oh, stuff that you take. Is yeah, not, not take, as in yeah, like picking oh, it out of the ground. Yeah, yes. that's for sure. <laughs> Definitely not. Uh, 
picking coffee trees is hard work. When I mean, you see the pickers over there at Origin, it really puts it in perspective of how hard it is. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, for the first three years, my wife Zoe and I did all the travel. Yeah. Um, we're doing all the coffee selection and buying. Yeah. Um, now, since uh, having a child, we've peeled that right back. And now we have our, our head roaster and green bean buyer. So he now travels the world and he's now going and cupping the coffees and choosing what we want. And, and, that, and that direct trade model, the most important thing is, is to make sure that we understand when we pay $10 for a, you know, a kilo of green coffee, how much of that $10 the farm is actually getting. Yes. Um, and that there's not an exporter or importer or some sort of broker that's taking a large cut out of that $10. Okay. So, um, again, to maintain the, um, well, the viability, I suppose, of the, uh, of the farms, right? Is that end goal on that? Yeah, I mean, it's getting, you know, and that's probably one of the biggest risks to the coffee industry over the next, like, few decades is that you're getting people, the next generation in certain, like, countries that we travel to that don't want to take over the farm, yeah. don't want to run coffee farms, and they're moving to the cities and they're taking, you know, office jobs and, and different jobs. So you're seeing that there's coffee farms that literally um, people are just walking off them and okay. they're not, it's not, hasn't got the viability in it to be able to sustain it. And so the supply of uh, specialty grade coffee um, across the world is gonna get harder and harder and harder, especially as consumption increases. Did you predict back in that 2008 sort of time frame? Is that when you got going? Have we got that timing roughly? Uh, roughly 2009. Right? 2009? Yeah. Did you predict that we would be such a big coffee drinking nation? Oh, we were already big back then. Okay. Uh, yeah, we, you haven't seen like huge, like, I mean, coffee consumption is growing. Yes. Um, but it hasn't had some huge spike over the last 10 years. Um, it seems to be that a lot more people understand or have taken an interest in our industry, in yep. the coffee industry. Um, it's definitely had a little bit of rock star status in the media um, sure. over the last 10 years. So people are, are sort of like into a little bit more. Like people got more into wine. Yeah. You know, it was only... 30, 40 years ago, everyone was buying wine in, you know, like cars. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then, uh, you yeah, know, we, we go to, you know, beer and like, you know, so VB had a 47% market share in Victoria only 20 years ago. And you think about that and, and I suppose that, you know, coffee's that next thing that people took an interest in and has been gone in a, a specialty sort of direction and people understand it. Yeah, because when I was, I was looking at the sort of the timeline of how you've built, I'm, I'm thought i wonder if you'd actually sort of um predicted we'd end up in this spot but what you're saying is we've we've been steadily going there for a while and um and you've just been able to build a build a brand within that yeah i think it's been steadily increasing all the way along i definitely didn't predict it would end up as the sitting here now like eight years later did i think that we'd end up in this position no i mean i wrote business plans and budgets for our first year of operation and and we, we just blew them out of the water it was it was amazing um, how quickly the people of Hawthorne um, and then the Greater Melbourne took to the brand and uh, jumped on board. When you started, where did you think you'd end up? Just with that one one good store, was that the plan? Uh, I mean, I always had a little bit of a plan behind the scenes that you know yeah. I'd like to have done a couple more stores and uh, you know expanded the brand. Um, did I necessarily think that you know I was going to get there? No, especially coming off the back of having you know, a mixed result of a couple of successful cafes and then that failed bar restaurant. Yep. You know, there's no guarantees. And I suppose I'm very conservative now. The night before we open every new shop, uh, I'm extremely nervous. Uh, I'm always concerned that it won't necessarily do the figures it needs to do. Um, so, and I think that's a good thing. I think that, that what happened with that restaurant bar is I had a, you know, a bit young and I had that touch of arrogance that, you know, I can just go and do any sort of venue and it'll be successful. Yeah. And um, that's just not the case, you know. And, and the same even now with the Axel brand. Um, I, I'm just waiting, you know. There, there'll be one sooner or later that we get wrong. Yes. Um, so, yeah, just always trying to, to be a bit conservative and, and, yeah, think about both sides of the coin depending on how each store goes. Yeah, well, it's probably good. Um, you'd probably start to worry if you weren't nervous, right? Yeah, like, oh, yeah, that's exactly right. As soon as you're not worried about it, um, is exactly when something will go wrong. And the plan is to continue to grow? 
Yeah, you end up in this um, perpetual cycle where I, I think we have to continue growing because you have this team of staff now yeah. that wants to grow the brand because they're part of the brand. So they want to open more stores okay. because it's they, they want the ability to earn more money and, and create more of a future for themselves. Um, and, and so do I to, to a certain point. And we also have the other pressure that we've got that group of senior staff that's waiting to buy into the next one. So if we suddenly stopped and said, we're not opening any more stores and we're not doing any new ventures, um, I'd have a problem because I'd have that, that next group of senior management that suddenly sees, oh, like my opportunity to go with this brand is, is now not there. You change the culture that you've built your whole business on, right? Just in... 100%, we've got to keep growing to be able to keep that culture. Yes. Um, so yeah, it is a little bit of a perpetual cycle in, in terms of fear. Yeah. And what does day to day look like? for you with a operation the size that you have? Uh, to, be, to be honest, oh, this is terrible because you, you hear about these business people that are working crazy hours and everything like that. Well, I work Monday to Friday now. I, I did 25 years. This is my 25th year in hospitality. Right. Um, so I've done plenty of nights and plenty of weekends and, and I remember when all my mates were out partying and it get to like 11 and 12 or I'd be, I'm like, I've got to go. Yeah. I've, you know, I've got to be up to open the cafe in the morning. So... Um, now it's not a, you know, I have a, a three year old girl and so yeah. my priorities changed. I work Monday to Friday, pretty much nine to five. Um, and I come in and now it's more about, uh, it's funny, yeah, it's more about dealing with banks and real estate agents and finance and, and dealing with the senior staff and making sure that like everybody's happy and everyone's sort of doing what they're supposed to be doing. Do you enjoy that as much as? perfecting your coffee making like back in the competition days because when you think about your skill set as a person they're vastly different right and a lot of people in a lot of different industries really struggle to make that transition from I suppose like you know that practical hands-on um, role through to a business owner where you know banks and real estate agents and all the rest of it come into play so are you still enjoying it yeah I think mine's the other way though that I, I went and did a business degree straight out of school in hospitality I always wanted to be in hospitality management uh, I was always coming from that angle um, it was actually probably harder for me to do the barista and to okay. actually get on the machine and push myself to be the best in that sort of uh, area of the industry. Yeah. And uh, so I worked extremely hard back in those days during that five years of the barista competitions to push myself to um, to win those competitions in that thing. But I always came from a business manager's angle. I always envisaged myself owning hospitality venues. Um, yeah, so it was so an easy transition. So you were, a, you were a business person that, yeah, okay. So you're a business person that went back and did the practical stuff to get the business rather than someone who got good practically and kind of fell into business. Yeah, I always say is, that, you know, I'm, a, uh, I'm definitely a biz businessman first. Yes. Um, and I was always a barista second. Um, you know, I've been a bartender, I've been a barista, I've been a waiter, I've, you know, I've done all sorts of different components along the way. But ultimately, the main driving thing for me was that I always wanted to be a hospitality operator and run venues. And you've just move to this venue here because your location at Hawthorne you're doing some changes to yeah so I mean we started with the original building in Hawthorne it was uh it's 700 square meters so it was a large building to start with we roasted all our coffee um out of the back of that building so we were roasting coffee and packaging it and delivering it to not only the cafes we owned but um other cafes where we don't own them but we just supply the coffee Yes. Um, and it just got to a point where we outgrown that space. Yep. Um, a building came up literally 400 metres from the original building. Um, it was just too good an opportunity not to take it. Um, so we took that building and applied for the planning permits and everything to be able to roast in this space. And uh, eventually, yeah, we've fitted it all out and, and moved and we're now roasting on site here. And so it left that vacant space at the old building. With which your... What are you turning that space into? Can so, you talk about that yet yeah, or not? Yes, yeah. So we're turning that into a barista training academy. So we obviously have our own baristas that we do a lot of training with and they're training for the barista competition. Mm -hmm. um, so our baristas recently took out first and second in the Victorian Championship for 2018. Oh, wow. So that was a great result. And so now they're training ready for the uh, Australian finals, which are in February. 
And yeah, so it'll be used for that. And also we do some training courses for the general public as well. So people can book off the website and come in and learn to make coffee. Or um, we, do, we do another course, great course called Farm to Cup. And it's a okay. two hour course that teaches you about how the coffee's picked and processed all the way through to how it ends up in your cup. Um, so yeah. And is that a popular... Yeah. The reason I ask, is it popular, is because with the rise of, as we were saying before, craft beers and the, um, I suppose we're, we're becoming a lot more interested in where our food and beverages come from as a, as a society, right? I think we're getting more and more concerned as to what's happening to a lot of those crops and, and, and how they're being treated. And we didn't have to worry about that maybe 50 years ago. Um, but I think we need to be a little bit more concerned now about... Um, yeah, where the food's coming from and how it's been treated and processed before we start consuming it. So your course is obviously a great way to learn about that and it's becoming popular because of, of those concerns, I suppose, isn't it? Yeah, and just a general interest in the coffee industry as well. People love uh, you know, coming along and learning where the coffee's come from and how to get the best out of it and try and make a cafe quality coffee at home. And what's the best way to go about that? It's it, to yeah, be honest, it's really it's really time consuming and really expensive. People sometimes think that they're going to be able to buy a coffee machine and buy coffee and milk and everything like that and yes. make coffee at home and suddenly going to save them money. <coughs> I don't think that's the case. Yes, <laughs> um, at all. Actually, I think you'll uh, you'll end up spending just as much money, but it might be a convenience thing that you don't have to leave the house or other things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, to buy a decent espresso machine, you probably two and a half thousand dollars yes um and there's no use having that unless you have a great coffee grinder to go with it the grinder is equally as important yes. on how it grinds the coffee um to how it extracts the flavor so you know really that's the the only home setup i recommend is about three thousand dollars yeah anything once you start getting cheaper than that you're just not going to get the quality that you get in a cafe um and then after that i mean you know, i've installed fifteen thousand dollar coffee machines into people's home that are you know very serious which is kind of entertaining con considering that i have a twenty dollar pour over at home and so in the mornings i just make a pour over coffee uh, with a paper filter i don't have an espresso machine at home convenience wins when you're trying to get out the door right yeah i, I suppose it also too i'm going to a cafe every day anyway so i don't have to worry about it i'm, I'm in and out of the cafes all day what's the uh, worst piece of advice you hear um, spoken about given in the hospitality industry from a business perspective that's the worst piece of advice but it's it's definitely that that for some reason our industry attracts people um, with very little hospitality experience that that think that they can operate a business like uh, you know we were talking before we started recording about yeah, the, the statistic, and I don't know the exact number, but something like 80% of hospitality businesses fail in the first two years. be interesting to understand and break that figure down, but I think you'd find of that 80%, a large percentage would have no formal you know, certificate or degree in hospitality and would have a very small amount, if any, of hospitality experience. Yes. Um, and that's, that's one of the hardest things. My advice is always... And I've had a few friends that have come to me and, you know, one was an accountant. I remembered he's like, oh, I really, you know, would like to open a cafe or, and I said, well, go and get a job in a cafe on Saturdays. Keep your Monday to Friday accounting job. Go and get a job in a cafe on Saturdays, waiting tables and whatever job they'll give you. Do that for three months. And then if you want to go and open a hospitality business after that, I'll, I'll give you some help and support you as much as I can. It's like, oh, I don't really want to work six days a week. I'm like, you really don't want to work in hospitality. <laughs> so he eventually uh, didn't do it. It was a couple of years ago now. And only recently he said to me how happy he was that I gave him that advice. And I think that's really what people need to do is just go and work in the industry at, at the you know, barista level or a waiter level or a dishwashing level yes. and see the back end of what really goes on. Yep. It's not as glamorous or as uh, fantastic as a lot of people see. Yeah. You know, going out for brunch thinking, oh, this would be great. I have my friends come in and it's just not like that. Yeah. No, at all. The, uh, every business has got their the daily grind, right, that you just have to 
have to get through and learn to love if you want to be successful. It's called work for a reason, yeah. yeah. It's, it's definitely, uh, there's, there's a small a part that's social and, and fun, but you know, on a general basis, it, it's still work. Is there anything that you do um, outside of work particularly that you think allows you to um, perform, build your business as you've had? Do you do anything relaxation-wise or whatever? I know you're a bit into motorsport, but that's only a recent thing, is that right? Yeah, so, I mean, I suppose, yeah, I have hobbies outside of work. Do any of them contribute to making Axel more successful? Uh, other than giving me a mental break to be doing something other than work. No, I, I was an avid snowboarder for a number of years, so I've done that for a long time and yeah. always enjoyed that. And, and as you said, now, you know, I've recently bought, yeah, bought myself a racing car and, you know, started going off and racing cars and, and having that sort of break. But that's funny, that's, that's actually... A, a massive challenge now. I find that hobby more challenging than I do the day-to-day axle now with the, the, the steep learning curve to learn about how to set up a race car and how to race a car. Um, yeah, it's more of a challenge than a relax now. And what do you, what's your biggest challenge in terms of the setup at the moment? Is there anything you're tinkering with to try and get, get right? Um, it's just like all these small 1% variables, you know what I mean? Like I think, yeah, I've got in and I've got myself within a couple of seconds of the leaders yeah. and now it's probably going to take me anywhere between like two years and never yeah. <laughs> to find that final two seconds. But uh, ultimately, uh, it's it's more for enjoyment at, at, you know, at my age. I'm not going to be a professional race car driver, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just been awesome to get away and uh, with my dad and, and do something that we enjoy. Yeah, awesome. Um, now, I'm just going to ask you a couple more questions. Uh, questions Dave before we wrap up um, any uh, book or documentaries that you recommend in terms of um, if you want to be a successful business person owner yeah there's, it's, it's fair to say that there's a there's a book that a, a fellow world barista championship finalist a guy called Colin Harmon oh. he's from Ireland and he put out a book uh, only reasonably recently and it's what I know about running cafes and even the title is really good. It's not like that he knows how to. It's just his version and, and his sort of journey of, of writing cafes and how he does it. Yeah. Um, we, we stop the book and sell it. And uh, it's, it's, it's really good to give you a little bit of an understanding of what's going on behind the scenes and why maybe we're doing things the way we do them. And if you get an example maybe from that book, um, something that you uh, have taken into your own business... It's funny, but there's nothing that, that when I read the book, it was more a case of, yep, that's why we do that. And, oh, yeah, we do the same thing because of the same reasons. And yep. we have a very similar philosophy about how we go about things and why we do certain things. And, and that's why I'd recommend it in all honesty is because, uh, yeah, he sort of really hits home some points about what you've got to do to be successful within this industry. It's funny with uh, reading and learning and the like, particularly in business, that a lot of the, the stuff that you do read, it's almost like it's confirmation that you're on the right track, or I, for me at least anyway, um, because if you're in uncharted waters in terms of continually growing, tomorrow is going to be something that you probably is going to come up that you haven't dealt with maybe before. So that, uh, I suppose that confidence just helps to keep going I guess would that be a fair statement yeah 100% it's just to yeah, make sure you're on the right path and that uh, there's somebody out there that's going through the same things you are and, and, and coming to the same result you are and if you could have one law changed what would it be I think we're going to do something around and, and people will, will understand this but that we're getting hospitality operators that are running up huge bills with suppliers not paying superannuation, not paying uh, their BAS requirements, their ATO requirements, and are simply getting you know three to six months down the path and uh, going into liquidation or administration, and then all these suppliers are getting paid like you know ten cents in the dollar, and, and they're walking away from you know their ATO debts and things like that. We've seen the laws change recently that superannuation now is personally guaranteed by the director of the company yep. um, so I think that's an important move um, but yeah literally you can liquidate your company and walk away from all those suppliers and there's a 
uh, like a three strike rule in place and the first time you basically just get a letter basically telling you that you know that you shouldn't be doing that yeah you know as you're walking away from you know in some cases millions of dollars worth of debt to you know milk supplies and meat supplies and it just shouldn't be done yep. um there's gonna have to be something done around that and it probably applies to a lot of other industries as well not only hospitality where yep, people are liquidating sure. and you know shuffling assets around behind the scenes and just blatantly doing the wrong thing um so that that some law or some change around that needs to happen maybe education about understanding your business right because i suppose you only have to do all of that uh you know, quote dodgy stuff or however you want to term it if you don't have a good handle on what is actually happening in your business and you don't know how to deal with it to i'd like to think the, that's the case yes. but also in some instances they have successful businesses and they're stripping huge amounts of money like cash out of those businesses okay so that's um, what you're talking about there there's that side of it and there's yes. also the other side we talked about where you're having yeah. operators that don't know what they're doing yeah. they've come into our industry from you know without very little hospitality experience that yes are desperately trying to do the right thing but are failing yes and there's the other one where people are deliberately going about pulling that out yeah. i think you'll see that change because you know over the years it's been a huge cash business and we're seeing that change now where 90 to 95 percent of our takings are fbos yes. credit card yeah um and that's a good thing uh so yeah I, i'd imagine we've been talking about it recently i think you're know, trying to make that move and go to 100 percent fbos and we've seen a few cafes in australia test the waters and go down that path and i'd imagine we've probably only got another five to ten years and you'll see that and i think that'll help to fix that problem as well um so there's a few things like that that need to be fixed. Can you see Bitcoin being a part of the way that we operate oh. in society? Isn't that the biggest pyramid scheme of our time? I mean, like, I, I don't... I mean, don't get me wrong, if you're an early adopter and you got in early and got out, then you're a rock star. But, yeah. I mean, there's, unfortunately, then, the, you know, with all pyramid schemes, there's then the ma and pa investors at the tail end that get in too late. That, that when the whole thing implodes, they're the ones left. Yep. So I suppose, yeah, if you're going to go into that or into hospitality for that matter, then yep. only invest as much as you're willing to lose. Probably some sound advice to finish on. Yeah. Cheers, yeah. mate. Thank you. No worries. Thanks for coming in.